Well, a very warm welcome to all of you here today, each and every one of you. A very special welcome to any guests that we have here today as well. We're so glad that you are here and glad that together uh, we can gather like this to glorify, to praise our God together, especially uh, in the midst of uh, another Advent season, a very, very special time uh, of the church year. And certainly uh, we look forward uh, to this time every season and uh, just to know that uh, we are anticipating together uh, the arrival of that greatest gift that God could ever give to us, the gift of his own son and our Savior, Jesus. So as we enter into this time of worship together, I want to share with you just a few verses from Psalm 67 as our invitation to worship today. The psalmist declares, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. And certainly that's why we're here today, to praise, to glorify the God of our salvation. As we gather in worship like this, God wants to greet his people. Would you please stand to receive that greeting? Well, congregation, God greets us this morning with these words. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in the power and fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, let's sing together. Let's lift our voices in praise.
Would you pray with me? <coughs> Father in heaven, we thank you for this new day you've given to us. And we are so thankful for this very special season of our church year. And as we journey through this time of Advent, as we anticipate, as we prepare to truly celebrate the coming of that greatest gift you could ever give to us, that King of heaven himself, that, God, you would truly be preparing our hearts. Put all of the distractions aside throughout this Christmas season. And all of the trees and the tinsel and the parties and the presents and the gifts and the goodies. Father, help us to focus. Help us to look deeply into that manger and to see the Savior you sent. So, Father, help us. Lead us and guide us through this season. Lead us and guide us through this time of worship today. We want it to bring glory to you. So, Father, we, we give this time and we give ourselves to you as well. And we pray this always in, and only in Jesus' precious name. Well, it is the third Sunday, three out of four, of course, in the season of Advent. So we're going to light another candle today, kind of mark that journey as we go. And today, again, we're, we're focusing on this, uh, this image of darkness and light, right? And we see that, that motif really weaved throughout Scripture. And so today, the, uh, the reading, the short litany that we're going to do together uh, comes to us from the prophets, very particularly the book of Isaiah. And we're going to go ahead and forward to the next screen, and we're going to see how we're going to uh, divide up today. As you know, we've been doing this in different ways. We, we've done east and west side. We've done men and women. Today, we're going to go by age. So if you're 40 and over, that's the 40 plus. And if you're 40 and under, that's the minus. If you happen to be 40, you can pick whatever one you want. How's that? All right? So I'm going to help lead uh, the 40 and plus, and uh, these two lovely women here are going to lead the 40 minus. All right? So let's join in this together, shall we? Let's begin with the, those 40 and over. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in the land of deep darkness, on them as light shone. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest on him. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. Let's sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel.
Well, together as uh, the family of God, we have the wonderful opportunity today to witness and celebrate together the baptism of one of our covenant children, and that is Imrickson Peter Wright, the newest addition here for the Wright family, for Derek and Julia. And uh, I know they're excited about this, and we are as well. And if you are a, a family member or friend who's visiting here today uh, for Derek and Julia and the family, uh, just welcome to you as well. We're glad that you could join us together. So as we uh, begin thinking about baptism together, I want to share with us just a, a few uh, of the questions and answers from the Heidelberg Catechism that remind us what this is all about. So listen uh, closely here. We'll begin with question and answer 69. It says, how does baptism remind you and assure you that, you are, that Christ's one sacrifice on the cross is for you personally? The answer says, in this way, Christ instituted this outward washing and with it gave the promise that as surely as water washes away dirt from the body, so certainly his blood and his spirit wash away my soul's impurity, in other words, all my sins. But what does it mean to be washed with Christ's blood and spirit? Well, to be washed with Christ's blood means that God, by grace, has forgiven my sins because of Christ's blood poured out for me in his sacrifice on the cross. To be washed with Christ's spirit means that the Holy Spirit has renewed me and set me apart to be a member of Christ, so that more and more I become dead to sin and increasingly live a holy and blameless life. But does this outward washing with water itself wash away sins? No. Only Jesus Christ's blood and the Holy Spirit cleanse us from all sins. Well, why then does the Holy Spirit call baptism the washing of rebirth and the washing away of sins? God has good reason for these words. He wants to teach us that the blood and Spirit of Christ wash away our sin, just as water washes away dirt from our bodies. But more important, he wants to assure us by this divine pledge and sign that the washing away of our sins spiritually is as real as physical washing with water. And finally, should infants too be baptized? Yes, infants as well as adults are in God's covenant and are his people. They, no less than adults, are promised the forgiveness of sin through Christ's blood and the Holy Spirit who produces faith. Therefore, by baptism, the mark of the covenant, infants should be received into the Christian church and should be distinguished from the children of unbelievers. This was done in the Old Testament by circumcision and has been replaced in the New Testament by baptism. So that reminds us again what this very precious sacrament uh, is really all about and what we're going to witness together in just a in just a few moments. But right now, Derek and Julia, since you are presenting Emrickson for baptism today, I'd like to invite you to come on up and join me up here, along with Aiden and Carolyn. And in just a moment, I've got a few questions for you, and then I'm going to ask uh, Kevin if he can come up and be the elder representative. But we'll do these questions uh, first of all. So I have three of them uh, for you. First of all, do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, accept the promises of God and affirm the truth of the Christian faith, which is proclaimed in the Bible and confessed in this church of Christ? Second, do you believe that Emrickson, though sinful by nature, is received by God in Christ as a member of his covenant and therefore ought to be baptized? And finally, third, do you promise in reliance on the Holy Spirit and certainly with the help of the Christian community, to do all in your power to instruct Imrickson in the Christian faith and to lead him by your example to be a disciple of Christ. Derek and Julia, how do you respond? Kevin, I'm going to invite you to come on up. And while Kevin is making his way up here, congregation, I invite you to, you to stand as well along with Derek and Julia I have a question for you as well. 
And following this question, the affirmative answer is, we do, God, helping us. Here's the question. Do you, the people of the Lord, promise to receive Emrickson in love, to pray for him, to help instruct him in the faith, and encourage and sustain him in the fellowship of believers? Congregation, how do we respond? We do, God helping us. Thank you. You may be seated. Are we sleeping now? Yeah. All right. Well, we'll see if maybe we can wake him up here a little bit. Oh, there's the eyes. Hello. Hi, Emerson. And what a beautiful picture on the screen behind us, too. Yeah. Well, our Lord said, let the little children come to me. Don't hinder them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Emrickson, Peter, write, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, we certainly did wake him up. And we are just so thrilled uh, for you guys and for you, Aiden and Carolyn, as you welcome a baby brother into the family and uh, just rejoice with you and your immediate family of how God is, is growing your family, how he's blessing your family. It's just so neat to see. But mostly, it's neat to see that you're all right here, right, right here, even in the shadow of the cross and even with the manger right behind you there. And again, reminding us of what this is really all about, of why we're here. And what this sacrament is. In just a moment, we're, of course, we're going to sing a song that you guys chose. And it's a song that has a lot of, a lot of family significance for you. And it's the song, Amazing Grace. And really, that's what it's all about. Right? It's all about God's grace. It's what we see happening here right now. It's why we are all gathered here today. And it's really the only reason why we have any hope whatsoever. And we're just thrilled as a church family that you have stood up here and pledged. Not only do I know and love and trust Jesus, but I want that for my kids too. And I want them to know that hope that he brings. And that is such a special thing. Uh, we want to give you a, just a little gift uh, for Emerson, this beginner's Bible. And uh, you guys can probably help read this one too. You've got one at home, I know, don't you already? You do. So this one is going to be just for your brother. And I've written a, a verse in there that uh, reflects this grace that we celebrate today. 2 Peter 3, verse 18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. That's our prayer. That's our prayer together for Emerson, For you guys, too, that's our prayer for all of us. That we grow in that amazing grace. So that's for you Kevin has a certificate for you as well. And we're going to sing that song together in just a moment. We're going to celebrate that grace. But right before we do, let's pray. Shall we pray together? Father in heaven, we are just so absolutely thrilled and grateful for what we have witnessed here together again today. Your amazing grace at work. To come in, into this family, into little Emerson's life. And Lord, we know he can't do anything for himself, but you come to him. And Father, what a, what a picture of your love and your faithfulness. Father, we pray a blessing on Emerson and Aiden and Carolyn too. As Derek and Julia as together, they seek to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And to give him glory no matter what. Father, we pray that as a church family, that we would surround them with our love and with all of the gifts that you have given to us to pour into them. Father, mostly we just say thank you. We're thankful for Jesus. And it's in his precious name we pray. Amen. Congratulations, and to you too, and you guys. All right. Well, we're going to sing Amazing Grace, so we're going to go down. The praise team's going to come on up. And we're going to stand together to sing the four verses of this song.
Well, what a wonderful way to lead into a community time of prayer together, uh, just celebrating what we've seen, celebrating God's grace uh, to us. And as we go to God in prayer, just a few things to pass on to you. Uh, there's a lot in your announcement sheet uh, for this week, and I think many of you, you you've seen that. There's lots going on. Uh, for folks in the life of our congregation and some connected to our congregation as well. Uh, so please uh, note all those. I'm not going to go through them all, but I want to highlight a couple. And just to let you know, if you missed it on the sheet or didn't hear, uh, that Jay Wolbert, of course, whom we've been praying for for a couple of weeks now as he's been in the hospital, he did pass away on Thursday. So we certainly want to be in prayer uh, for those uh, who are mourning Jay's loss. And uh, there's no arrangements that have been made at this time. As soon as we find something out, we'll pass that on uh, to everyone. So uh, watch your emails uh, for that as well. Uh, then also, uh, I'm sure you noticed uh, on the list of prayer items too, we want to be in prayer for Seth, uh, Seth Veal, uh, and the Veal family as well. Um, many of us probably know, and I know that uh, Seth hasn't ever really kept this uh, private in any way in that respect, that he has uh, born with a, a heart defect, um, congenital heart defect from what I understand. And uh, they knew for a long time uh, that uh, the surgery uh, was inevitable, that it was coming, uh, just thought it would be a few years further down the line. Uh, but uh, according to the doctors, uh, that surgery needs to be done very soon. And it is going to be done soon. December 21 uh, is the date uh, for that open heart surgery for Seth. So we certainly want to be in prayer for Seth and, uh, and for the family too. He's got another surgery, a procedure uh, just a few days before that, I believe on, a, on December 17, uh, has to do with your esophagus, right? It's an esophagus surgery. So we're going to pray for that too, obviously. And that's kind of in preparation for that surgery the following Monday. So, so Seth's got a lot going on. And the family does too. And we're going to be in prayer for you, Seth, uh, every step of the way. Um, then one other note, uh, and that has to do with uh, Pastor Pete uh, DeHaan. Uh, his brother Case passed away yesterday after a, a battle with cancer. So we want to be in prayer for that family too. So we've got lots to pray about. And uh, we're so glad that we have a God who hears our prayers who answers our prayers as well according to his will, uh, to what's going to give him glory and what's going to be ultimately for our good. So let's go to him in prayer together. Most merciful God and Heavenly Father, Lord, it is so good to be able to gather and worship today. And so good in the midst of this time of gathering and praising your name to be able to to quiet our hearts and go to you in a time of prayer and to acknowledge you as the king of this universe, to acknowledge you of being the one and only who is the creator of all, of everything, big and small, visible and invisible, to know that you are the one true God, that you are a God of power, that you are a God of glory, but that you are also a God of love and you are most certainly a God of grace. And Father, we are so grateful for that love and that grace, that, that faithfulness, that kindness that you have shown into our lives. We are so grateful, God, that you have revealed to us and given to us your Son, our Savior, Jesus. We're grateful for that gift of forgiveness by grace through faith in Him, and that hope of everlasting life. And Father, to be able to see that grace on display just a moment ago in the baptism of a, another covenant child for Emrickson, what a gift you've given to us in that. Father, we're so grateful for that sacrament. And again, so very grateful for, uh, for the way that you remind us even over and over again that you are a God of grace. Lord, we're so thankful for the ongoing work of your Spirit as well. For that ongoing work in this world around us and for that ongoing work in our very lives. For your sanctifying fire that reminds us each and every day of your goodness to us and refreshes us to want to live for you and to seek your face 
with all that we are. God, we've got a lot going on in our life as a congregation. We have many, many names uh, in front of us. And those people have needs in their lives. So, Lord, we want to pray for them, each one of them today. We do pray for Seth uh, and Matt and Jen and James, too, as Seth faces uh, heart surgery uh, a week from tomorrow. And another procedure done before that, uh, just a few days before on December 17. Father, we pray that uh, you would continue your faithfulness into Seth's life as you have for so many years. Lord, surround him with uh, a great measure of your peace and calm any anxiety that he has. Remind him again, as certainly he knows, that you are carrying him and the Veal family too. Father, we pray already and we pray in faith that the surgery would go well. And we pray, Lord, that uh, you would grant healing into Seth's body. Father, we pray too for others who need you in very special ways today. We think of those who've just lost loved ones. We think of the Wolbert family and the loss of Jay, over the Dahan family and the loss of Case. We pray that you would give uh, comfort for those who mourn, that you would surround them again with the knowledge and assurance of your presence. Be with Leon Scolton, and he continues in hospice care. Father, may he know that you are there with him. And Father, we pray for Alice as she continues with cancer treatments, that those will go well for her. And Father, we give you thanks for others who've had uh, things going on in their, in their health and in their lives, but uh, are doing well. We think of Ron Muckman, the little time he had to spend in the hospital, but is out and doing much better. We're thankful for that. For Ruth McDonald as well, as she's recovering from having a pacemaker and defibrillator put in, and all went well there, we're very grateful. For Tammy Scolton, as she's recovering well from her back surgery, uh, Father, your hand of healing has been upon her. We're so grateful for that. We think of Colin Unima and Hannah Ritzma too, and Father, the exciting things happening in their lives, and for Colin, as he's now graduated from basic training, and Hannah Ritzma, as she's made her way through tech school now and graduated from that. Father, we just continue to pray for your leading in their lives and that they would consistently and constantly look to you uh, for that guidance that they need. But we think, too, of Bobby Brennan today and continuing need for a kidney, and we know he's been struggling as of late. But along with that, we pray for his wife, Stephanie, and their son, Isaac. Uh, we know this is something that a, a family... Uh, goes through together so we pray for your grace in their lives too that you would provide for what they need father we we know that this list of names uh, is not exhaustive in terms of people uh, even from this congregation and the things that they're dealing with these are just those things that we know about there are many things that so many of us keep to ourselves or it's just between us and you lord we pray for all of these needs too and we're thankful to know that you are a God who hears our prayers and who knows what we need even before we ask it. And that you will respond, that you will answer, and that we trust that will be for your glory and for our good. Father, we pray for all of our missionaries, especially in this time of the year as there, many of them uh, have to be away from close family. Be with them and encourage them, uh, strengthen them. Father, certainly for the events uh, in the world around us, uh, in our nation, in our world, as it continues to battle this virus, and we hear exciting news uh, of a vaccine being rolled out uh, even today, uh, starting distribution. It's an answer to prayer to be sure. We want to acknowledge that. And Father, we pray that uh, this vaccine would be effective, and that it could be distributed well and distributed quickly, and uh, Lord, that it would bring an end uh, to this pandemic. Father, for these things, uh, and again, so much more, we bring them to you. We do so in faith and trust, and believing. And Father, we, we know the promise of your word, uh, that when we bring our cares and concerns uh, to you, that you will honor that, because you truly do care for us. Father, be with all of us as we continue this journey through the season of Advent, this very special time of the year. 
And for some of us, because of outside circumstances, it might not feel like Christmas so much. But Lord, remind us as we get closer and closer to that Christmas day of that marvelous, incomparable gift you've given to us in your Son, our Savior Jesus. And it is in his name we pray and in the power of the Spirit. Amen. Well, we're going to turn our attention to God's Word together uh, this morning. And if you uh, have a Bible, if you've brought a Bible with you, I want to invite you, uh, if you want to go ahead and uh, find the book of Micah uh, in the Old Testament, you can turn there a moment. We're going to get to that text in just a, a bit. And uh, again, don't worry if you haven't brought a, a Bible. Uh, we're going to be looking at Micah chapter 5, the uh, first few verses in that chapter. But it's going to be on the screen in just a moment too. So, Now, I think as uh, many of you know, and I've mentioned this uh, again a couple of times uh, already today, we are journeying together through this season of Advent. And uh, we are continuing uh, in the, the midst of this journey to look at a variety of pictures of Jesus uh, that the Old Testament gives to us. And as most of you know, for the past several weeks, uh, in the context of this essential Jesus campaign that we are currently engaged in, that we've really settled into the Old Testament. And in that connection, of course, we've taken a look at some stories, we've taken a look at some psalms that very clearly picture for us the promised Messiah. And really give us a, a deeper and richer understanding of who he is and what he's all about. Well, today, and really next Sunday as well for that matter, we're going to set up camp uh, in the land of biblical prophecy before we finally get into the New Testament on Christmas Day. So this week in our reading guide, uh, we were invited to read a variety of Old Testament prophecies about the Savior who was coming. And those were prophecies, of course, that went all the way back to the time of Abraham and reached all the way forward as far as the time of Zechariah. That was the span. And so really we're looking at a, a approximately 1,500 years of history there that those prophecies uh, covered for us in those readings. Now each one of those prophecies that we had the chance uh, to read this past week certainly is important, it's vital, each one in terms of its connection to Jesus. But since it is the season of Advent, we're going to focus in on one of those particularly, and that's going to be that one in the prophecy of Micah. So Micah chapter 5, uh, verses 1 through 5, is that passage I'd like to share uh, with all of us today. It's going to be our main passage for this morning. Again, if you've got your Bibles, you can follow along. Otherwise, it's there on the screen behind me. So let's listen together to God's Word. Now muster your troops, O daughter of troops. Siege is laid against us. With a rod they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. And he shall be their peace. So that's as far as we want to read in God's word this morning. And we trust that he will bless his word to us today. So as we take a look at this uh, particular prophecy today, and as we're going to continue to think about prophecy in the week to come as well, I just thought it might be good for us to get to kind of a, a basic understanding of what biblical prophecy is really all about, right? What is the essence of biblical prophecy? Because I would imagine for most of us, prophecy isn't something that we think about a lot. It's certainly not something we hear about a lot. 
And so for, for many of us, uh, w- when we hear that word of prophecy even today, maybe we think of a, a palm reader, maybe we think of tarot cards, maybe we think of the latest book that's been written about the end of the world or something along those lines. That's what kind of floods into our thoughts when we hear that word prophecy. But we're talking here today about biblical prophecy, and biblical prophecy is really a, a different animal altogether. So as William Cunahome describes it, he says, at its heart, biblical prophecy is about proclaiming God's truth in a particular situation. And, and he labels that forth-telling, forth-telling. And he explains that a little bit. He says, over the years, God's people, the Israelites, developed some very sinful habits like idolatry, corruption, and oppressing the poor. The prophets forcefully articulated what God's standards were and how he wanted his people to live. Right? So that's that forth telling aspect of biblical prophecy. It's about proclaiming God's truth into a particular situation. Now, in addition to that, as Cunahom points out, another aspect of biblical prophecy involves predicting. God's plan for the future. And this he labels as foretelling, right? Foretelling. And he goes on to explain, in the Old Testament, one of the most common themes of prophetic books was a coming day of judgment, the day of the Lord. Many of the prophets warned God's people that their idolatry and sin would eventually bring punishment. And by the way, he says, these prophecies all came true when Babylon destroyed Jerusalem and took God's people into exile in 586 B.C. So just so we understand, at the very start, as we have a couple of weeks dealing with biblical prophecy, what it's really all about, that it has these two aspects with it, right? Two sides of this biblical prophecy coin. On the one side, it's foretelling, and on the other side, it's foretelling. But really, at a a very basic way, we need to understand together that biblical prophecy is not about just purely words and thoughts of a prophet, right? But in fact, these are words from God, right? That the prophets themselves spoke in God's place, so to speak. They were God's mouthpiece, Right? And that's what we need to make sure we understand. These aren't just words and thoughts of, of prophets that pop up in Scripture from time to time. That's not what it's all about. They are God's mouthpiece. Now, Peter, of course, as we look into the New Testament, Peter affirms that. Right? He kind of reemphasizes that. So in, 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 he puts it this way in chapter 1, verse 21 of his second letter. He says, For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So I just think we need to know that right from the start. Now as we think about that, another very important feature of Old Testament prophecy is that it very frequently predicted the coming of the Messiah. right? The coming of the Savior. God's promised Messiah who would bring salvation to you and to me. Right, in fact, biblical theologians say there are over 300 of these uh, these messianic prophecies that we find in the scope of the Old Testament. Over 300 of them. And by the way, they go on to say Jesus fulfilled every single one. All 300 of them that Jesus fulfilled. And so, the one that we want to talk about this morning is from the prophecy of Micah. Now, Micah is a really interesting book, right? You you may know this, but it's one of the minor prophets, right? One of the minor prophets, and there are 12 minor prophets in the scope of the Old Testament. There are major prophets, too. You probably know that, right? Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, the three major prophets. Now, it's not to say that minor prophets aren't as important or significant or authoritative as the major ones. It's just to say that the major prophecies are much longer, right? They're they're long books of the Bible where the minor ones are relatively short. 
So Micah is one of these minor prophecies. And in fact, it's only seven chapters long. Maybe you've got your Bible open. You're kind of flipping through that already. And you've checked that out. It's only seven chapters long. But even in its brevity, Micah really packs a punch. So as one person describes it, Micah, he says, was no TV preacher. His messages weren't slick, packaged, or positive. They were rough and passionate and hard-hitting. And he says he would make a terrible fundraiser because his main theme was to denounce sin, especially on the wealthy and the powerful. So this is Micah. But you know, Micah's not trying to be popular. Micah's just trying to be faithful, right? He's trying to be faithful to the word that God has given him to speak to the people, the people of Israel, very specifically to tell them that they were going to be punished for their sins. But you know, even in the midst of the doom and gloom of Micah's prophecy, we find one of the more spectacular passages in all of the Old Testament. And it's a passage in which Micah looks beyond his current situation to a time really in the far off future when God would send a Savior. And he says this Savior will hail from Bethlehem. Now that may not strike us really in any way, shape, or form, but really to Micah's original audience, it struck them severely. Many of us, I'm guessing, have this this picture in our head about Bethlehem, right? Bethlehem, after the time of Jesus' birth, it's getting kind of a, we might say, even a romantic reputation, right? And most of us, especially if we haven't been there in person, if we haven't gone to the Holy Land, we have this little quaint picture in our mind's eye, right? And we have this picture of the silent and holy night and, and the star there and over Bethlehem, and, and we have Jesus being born in this nice, cozy stable and, and laid in a, in a manger that's uh, filled with hay, maybe something like we have represented up here today. Maybe that's the kind of the picture we have in our mind's eye of Bethlehem, even today. Well, I can tell you that Bethlehem looks nothing like that today. I mean, Bethlehem's become quite a, a tourist destination. I mean, this is This is a little shot. I didn't take this, but this is a shot of Bethlehem today. Is that anything like the little quaint picture you might have in your head? I doubt it. Right? But this this is Bethlehem today. It's quite a bustling little city. In fact, it was much more bustling than I imagined it to be. Renee and I had the opportunity to go uh, over to the Holy Land for a very brief visit uh, back in 2011, I think we figured it was. Right? And, and we heard one day we were going to spend a couple hours in Bethlehem, and we were really, really excited about that, right? Because we have this picture in our head, and here, this is what we come into. We're like, this isn't near, you know, what I'm thinking of, right? It's a really bustling little city. But ancient Bethlehem was nothing of what it is today. Absolutely nothing. And it wasn't even really close to the quaint little picture that you and I often have in our mind's eye either. It was was literally nothing. Nothing's the key word here. There was nothing about Bethlehem whatsoever that would strike you as significant in the least. Nothing. It's only claim to fame. It's singular claim to fame. And it was hardly that at this time was that David, right, the shepherd boy who became king over Israel, David had been born there. That was its only claim to fame. But when Micah's writing here, it's 300 300 years after that, right? So it's nothing. There was nothing absolutely about Bethlehem that would strike people as it being significant. Nothing to make them stand up and take notice of it. Nothing to make them think that anything of any significance significance would come in any way, shape, or form. But yet here's Micah. And he's shouting out for all to hear that Bethlehem, of all places, Bethlehem was going to be the birthplace of the Savior. I mean, little, 
little insignificant Bethlehem as it's nestled in the, the shadow of mighty Jerusalem. It was going to be that point on planet earth where God's promised Messiah would enter our time and space. It must have sounded absolutely ridiculous, absolutely preposterous to Micah's first audience. I would suggest as preposterous as it would sound to you and me that, that our next president would come from Hamilton or even from Holland. We'd say, no way. No way. But Micah is crystal clear. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, you're not even a blimp on the, on the radar screen, he says. Out of you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel. But in the midst also of Micah's prophecy about Bethlehem, we also learn a couple of very important things about this Savior who's coming. So first of all, with respect to what we might call his origin. Right, so although the Savior is going to be born and get his earthly start in Bethlehem, nevertheless, Micah says, his coming forth is from old, from ancient days. That little phrase there, the last little phrase, from ancient days, is a really, really important one. It could have been translated, and perhaps should have been more accurately translated as, from days of eternity. Right, speaking to the fact that this Savior who's coming is unlike any individual planet Earth has ever seen. Because after all, you know as well as I do that every single human being has a definite beginning and an end, physically speaking. Right? You and I, we have a definite beginning, a definite end. We are born and we die. But Micah says not so with the Savior who's coming. His origins are from ancient days, from days of eternity. Right? This is Micah's way of saying he has no beginning and he has no end. In other words, who's the Savior who's coming? He is none other than God himself. Because God is the only being who has no beginning and no end. It's just on and on and on. He is God. So although the Savior is going to be born, he's going to take on human flesh and blood, nevertheless, he is fully and completely God. Micah said that already, way back then. John, of course, picks up on that, doesn't he? In his opening chapter of his gospel account, remember what John says? In the beginning was the Word. He's talking about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. That's not original for John. John's looking all the way back to Micah. He says, Micah told you this already. How many years ago of who this Savior is, who this promised Messiah truly is? He is God in the flesh. But it's not only that. right? In addition to revealing his origin, as it were, Micah also, in the midst of this prophecy, reveals something about the character of this coming Savior. So, e echoing other prophets like Jeremiah, whom we read this past week, Micah tells us that this Savior, he will stand and shepherd his flock. Right? In other words, this shepherd will be, this Savior will be the shepherd that the people so desperately need. Right, especially in the midst of all of the, the other so-called shepherds, right? The, the religious leaders in Israel whom, whom Jeremiah says that they're destroying, they're scattering the sheep. But in that context, the Savior will be the good shepherd. Right, that shepherd who will stand and shepherd his flock. Right, Jesus, you know, took that title on for himself, right? In John chapter 10. Jesus says, hey, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the one Jeremiah was talking about. I'm the one Micah was talking about. Right? I will stand and shepherd my flock. I'm the good shepherd. Right? I know my sheep. My sheep know me. And on top of that, Micah also says that this coming Savior, this Messiah, 
that he's going to bring peace. Right? In fact, as Micah concludes this little section of prophecy, he says, he himself, the Savior himself, will be our peace. In other words, the, the peace that the Savior will send, it is so much more than just a, just a lack of conflict that you and I might, might yearn for, right? So much more than that. So much more than any, any national peace that the people of Israel were, were longing for. Now the peace that this Savior is going to bring is a peace with God. Right? It's a peace founded upon forgiveness. Right? It's a, it's a cleansing of sin, right, that the Savior will make possible, you know, even by way of his own sacrifice. Zechariah, in our readings this week, Zechariah prophesied that. He tells us about the one they have pierced, right? You remember that language from some of the readings we had? The one they had pierced, the one who by way of his sacrifice, he says, is going to open up a fountain to cleanse from sin and impurity. That's what Jesus is talking about. Right in Luke chapter 18, he says, Everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He'll be handed over to the Gentiles. They'll mock him. They'll insult him. They'll spit on him. They'll flog him. They'll kill him. And that's a sacrifice. But as the Apostle Paul would tell us in Romans chapter 5, again echoing Micah, that will bring us peace with God. Right, that renewed and restored relationship with God, that, that relationship that had been devastated by sin. It's going to bring us back into that right relationship right, for any and all who believe. And there's a lot going on with Micah. And I hope you had the chance to read through those various prophecies this past week those suggested readings if you didn't go back and read them or maybe even if you did go back and read them again with what we've thought about today with our understanding of what prophecy is all about looking at it through what what the way that Micah is sharing with us and even as we get into the prophecies this coming week they're all going to be from the prophecy of Isaiah right one of those major prophets I mean, prophecy is just a, it's a fascinating genre of Scripture. But you know, more than that, this prophecy is absolutely foundational for our understanding of who Jesus is and, and what he really came to do. And so in that respect, may, may this Jesus, whom the prophets declare, May he and he alone be the one that we are looking forward to celebrating come Christmas Day. And so may it truly be our prayer. Again, echoing what Micah says here. Let this be our prayer. We, we know this. It comes from a very familiar Christmas carol. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Oh, come to us. Abide with us. Our Lord, Emmanuel. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you for an opportunity to dive just a little bit deeper today into biblical prophecy and to set up camp, as it were, for a couple of weeks in the, the prophecies of the Old Testament. Prophecies that point us toward Jesus and allow us to understand a little bit more about him and what he really came to do. And today we've thought about Bethlehem, that the Savior would hail from this small, small city that this would be that point on planet Earth where the Messiah would come. And Father, to understand a little bit about this Messiah from what Micah shares, that he's not just anyone, he is God in the flesh. That he is 
Emmanuel. That he'll be that good shepherd. That he will bring us peace. Peace with you. Father, we pray that as we anticipate Christmas Day, just uh, oh, less than two weeks away, that, Lord, we might truly know who it is we are celebrating. Not just about him, but know him in the depth of our heart. To believe on him as the Savior you have sent. Bless us to that end, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing a song that uh, reminds us of Bethlehem, once in royal David's city. So let's stand and let's sing together. close in just a moment with a couple of verses of Hark the Glad Sound, the Savior comes. Right before we do, just a couple of things to highlight. Uh, as you make your way out uh, today, you'll have the opportunity to, uh, to give of your offering. Today the offering is for uh, our Grafscott Operating Fund, so please take note of that. Then also a uh, reminder that your 2021 ministry plan votes are due by tomorrow. And uh, if you want to turn it in today, the box is right back there on the tables uh, that will be on your right as you exit. Then finally, just uh, also want to highlight uh, that a week from Wednesday on December 23, which is Christmas Eve Eve, uh, there is going to be an opportunity to gather here at 7 o'clock and sing. Just sing some Christmas songs and sing the songs of the season. There's so many out there. We don't get to sing them all, so... Um, that is uh, an invitation and an opportunity for all ages. All ages. There'll be something for everyone. So go home, mark that on your calendar, and uh, make sure you come back a week from Wednesday for that. Uh, before we sing together, God gives to us his parting blessing. Receive that blessing now. May the love of God the Father and the grace of Jesus Christ the Son, the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit, be with each one of you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.